So thanks a lot for everybody for coming. It's a very special session here, how to generate ideas for research. And uh, I'm very pleased to have some experts here on the podium with us, and they will enlighten you how to do it. And uh, this is particularly important for PhD students uh, in the audience and also young academics. But of course, uh, old folks like me still have to learn on this dimension too. Let me just throw some uh, questions uh, at them before we start. Uh, some questions I have, you know, how risky should you, how much risk taking should you do when you start a new project? Should you go for risky things or more, you know, epsilon extensions, less risky things? Uh, I often say it's, it's more risky not to be risk taking, I think. Uh, should it be very early on in new fields or should you ride a wave? So that's uh, another thing. And should you be part of a new fade momentum and all that? And should you come with an agenda ex ante? Or often is it the case that you have an idea, you work on it, and have another idea, and you come with an agenda later on. So expose the agenda realizes, or do you start with an agenda up front? And these are just a few questions uh, we hopefully will hear the answers to. Um, and we decided we go in the following order. So Ralf Kutchen will go first, then Ulrike Malmendir a uh, second, and then Johannes Ströbel will go. And we will have a lot of time, hopefully, to you have each of about 20 minutes opening remarks. And then we would like to have it interactive. And we have, if you want to ask questions, please come to the mic. You can also line up behind the mic and you can ask your questions you always wanted to know uh, from the experts. And, um, and then hopefully we will be done after two hours. All of the floor is yours. Okay, well, uh, thank you for uh, including me in this panel, Marcus. Uh, this was uh, like a hard panel to be uh, to preparing for. I think none of us really knew like what to, at least I'm talking to Johannes, didn't know what to say. So um, let's give it a go. So um, so I think there's, I don't know, uh, there's probably no formula how to do creative, like impactful research. Uh, but at the same time, I hope that like Johannes, Marcus and Ulrika are gonna prove me wrong uh, on this. Um, but like what I try to do, the way I try to approach it is to um, to think of like, like um, uh, some themes that I think would have helped me when I was junior, uh, and hopefully they are helpful to you uh, to you as well. So um, I'm gonna have like a, I'm gonna go in three steps. So first, uh, I'll discuss a little bit like the motivating examples um, uh, that I'm gonna use throughout my uh, comments. Um, I want to comment a little bit related to what Marcus was saying on how to think about impactful research. I think there's different perspectives on that. Um, and then um, uh, I'm gonna try to give some concrete suggestions on on how to identify and develop a research agenda. Um, and so Marcus asked me to talk about like uh, two agendas we've been working on. One is related to insurance markets and one related to asset demand systems and inelastic markets. Um, so just as a bit of background for those of you who haven't seen it, um, the basic idea behind those is in insurance markets is that there's a lot of work in economics on demand side frictions in insurance markets like related to informational frictions like adverse selection, uh, moral hazard. Um, and what we've been working on together with Modo Yogo is to, um, to think about the importance of supply side frictions like financial and regulatory frictions and recognizing the fact that insurance companies operate in imperfectly competitive markets and try to understand what it implies for the existence of certain markets, the design of insurance contracts and the pricing of those contracts uh, and more broadly about the financial fragility of the sector. And that actually led, as I'll talk about later, that led actually to the second sort of like agenda we've been exploring on asset demand systems. And so that is sort of the basic idea that in all of our asset pricing models, we start from like writing down a model of demand to impose market clearing and outcome, outcome pricing. Um, but sort of empirically, what we tend to do is we just focus on prices and fundamentals and, and don't use holdings and flows all that much. And so the whole idea behind demand system asset pricing is to incorporate data on holdings and flows and develop theories and frameworks to, to, to try to understand all that data together. So I'm gonna to refer to those agendas in, in my comments. Um, so some thoughts on like what it means for research to be impactful. Uh, and I think there's like four dimensions at least you can think about. So one, of course, that's the obvious one is sort of academic impacts in terms of like citations, being invited for seminars, conferences, and what have you. I'll have some more to say about that on the next slide. Um, but then you have to sort of at some point also decide a little bit in terms of like, like, like perhaps beyond sort of academic impact, like what other influence you, you are trying to have. So you could imagine like, impacting uh, policymakers like central bankers, uh, insurance regulators, and so on. Uh, you could imagine that, that you're interested in influencing um, the industry itself, uh, the financial industry, think about asset management research and, and related issues. 
Um, and then there's a fourth one, which is I'm going to refer to as like broader societal impact. Um, and of course, these are correlated, and if you can hit all of them, then like all the better. Um, but they're actually like 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 pretty far from perfectly correlated, I think. And so, just to give you like an example from my own experience, um, like we've been like together with Stein van Uylberg, we wrote a paper on combining health and life insurance, and we thought it was kind of a potentially important idea in the following setting, where uh, there's a lot of like new treatments that are being developed for um, for diseases that are incredibly effective, so they really extend life by uh, by a significant amount. Uh, but there's a lot of discussion about like who's going to pay for those treatments because they tend to be really expensive. But that conversation typically involves like uh, the government, like households and pharmaceutical companies because they're you know, setting the prices. Um, and the point that we were we were making is that there's another beneficiary of those life-saving treatments, and that's life insurance companies. And lots of people have life insurance, and so the moment you get those treatments and you lengthen sort of the life expectancy of of a, of a policyholder. Um, then that's really valuable to the insurance company, to the policyholder. Uh, it saves the government potentially money. And it's good for the pharmaceutical industry as well because they're selling more drugs. Um, and so we wrote this paper uh, kind of like anticipating already that this sort of like in terms of like citations was not going to do very much in the sense that like, like once you write the paper and the idea, there's not that much that follows from it. Um, but then we do think that it's potentially like a valuable idea like because it could actually um, make progress in making these new frontier treatments uh, widely available to a lot of a lot of households, and so I think there's like trade-offs between these different areas. And of course, as I mentioned, like if you can do all of them, then and all the better. Um, but I think there's um, uh, imperfect correlation. Okay, now what about academic impact? So I think here uh, is going to be related to what Marcus was talking about. I think there's like a different sort of like impulse response function in terms of citations or impact depending on your research strategy. And I think, uh, at least in my mind, there's like three different strategies that people are following and maybe there's more, but uh, one of them is to work on current themes or like writing like the recent wave. And so in recent years, you could imagine like research on COVID, like ESG investing or closer to um, what I'm doing related like machine learning and asset pricing. Now, sort of if you work on that and you publish those papers, they tend to have like a high short run impact because lots of people are working on that. Uh, there's lots of people you have to talk to. So in that sense, that's, uh, that's very nice. Um, they tend to be easier to publish, that's my impression, because you kind of skip the, the, the why do we care question because lots of people are working on it, so the implicit assumption is that it's important. Now, the long-run impact may be more uncertain in, in those cases because these are new themes, and in some cases they will, uh, they will um, have a long-run impact. In other cases, it's less clear. The second sort of area, I think, is like long-standing questions. So there's still a lot of, I know, questions we've been thinking about like for like a very, very long period of time, like, I know, why are markets so volatile, like return predictability, Publishing in those areas tends to be more challenging because oftentimes you're going to get feedback along the lines of like, well, this is a very mature field. Like, like, is it really a significant enough contribution? At the same time, if you are able to make sort of a significant contribution, then I think there's less uncertainty about the long run impact and sort of citations tend to be very steady over time. And then the last one, which I think is the most exciting one, is of course, try to explore and develop new research areas. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the remainder of this talk. Um, now there, the publication process is typically a lot more challenging um, uh, in the sense that like you're gonna face questions like why do we care? Like why did no one do this before? Um, and, and issues like that. Um, the short run impact as a result may be much lower. Like fewer people are working on this. Um, but if it catches on, and, and obviously it's a big if, um, then you're gonna have a higher long run impact as a researcher. Now in some cases, if you develop a new area, uh, for instance, you have like much better data than anyone before, then there's less uncertainty about that. But if you're like really moving into a direction like, uh, for instance, we did with insurance, where few financial economists uh, were working on this, uh, then there's a lot more risk involved, I think. So just to give you an idea of like how under-researched insurance is, uh, and to make a plea for more research on insurance, I guess, um, a couple of years ago, like the AFA had like over, I think, 1,200 submissions, and there were like uh, uh, eight of them were on insurance. Uh, compare that to the size of the industry, uh, and you can sort of... Uh, 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 make the point that this is I don't, not a very active area. So if you decide to start working on that, uh, citations don't come very fast. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to give some concrete suggestions uh, on, on how to develop uh, uh, a research agenda. So first of all, start thinking in terms of a research agenda. I think that's, that's important. Um, some comments on how to best prefer to best prepare yourself. Uh, I'm gonna argue that we should take a lot more risk in the field than maybe we currently do. Um, um, the challenges you may face with a new research agenda and why that shouldn't stop you from doing it. Uh, and then um, the hardest part, like where do you start? Um, so I think for all of, I don't know, for most people, it's hard to sort of estimate in advance, like, like whether a paper is going to be impactful. 
at the same time, I think sort of like thinking in terms of a research agenda is going to help you to focus on bigger questions. Like at least for like 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 me and my co-authors, I think it is we often talk about like what the sequence of papers is that we want to write. Um, now, how many of those we actually write uh, is a bit path dependent, but we do like to think about sort of okay, here's kind of like the arc of the agenda uh, that we're exploring. What it like allows you to do is not necessarily to sort of like figure out what the next paper to write is, but at least it stops you potentially from writing papers that are I know, smaller, or if you can't figure out what the next sort of like set of papers would be, um, then that may sort of like focus you on, on broader issues. So let me just give you examples of like how we thought about some of these questions just to make it perhaps a bit more tangible. Um, so what we noticed sort of is during the financial crisis, uh, some insurance companies showed like, like very odd pricing behavior uh, in some insurance contracts. It was a fairly narrow set of, of contracts, um, but it led us to sort of like reason that the most natural explanation was related to like financial constraints. And that led us to think about, well, what was the shock that actually got them constrained that led us to, to work on verbal annuities? Um, and then the question came up like, okay, why were these companies so levered in the first place? And that was, I know one of the reasons was that they used off balance sheet activities that we refer to as shadow insurance. And so from just like that one sort of idea, we sort of like knew that uh, the other two papers would follow from that. Um, but then the, there was sort of a nice segue to the new agenda on asset demand systems. And that was the idea that like, if an insurance company were to fail, and we sort of, like Modo and I argued that, that would have a large impact on the corporate bond market because insurance companies are the largest investor in corporate bonds. Um, and then we often got the question, well, how large would that impact be? Um, and then we kind of blanked uh, because our models are not very good at understanding like big shifts in demand. And we felt a bit uncomfortable with that, being uh, both asset pricers, um, that we couldn't really answer like a basic question, like suppose there's a big demand shock in financial markets, how do prices respond? And so then we sort of like, like started exploring demand systems. And then we realized that this was I know, a very hard problem, but if we could make some progress on that uh, with, I know, hopefully others uh, to follow, then there's a lot of other questions that you can start thinking about um, that also in involve like large shifts in demands, like quantitative easing and quantitative tightening, uh, global savings glut, the transition from active to passive management, the growth in ESG investing, all of those involve like large shifts in demand. And so sort of like, it's kind of like unavoidable to start thinking about models that get the asset demand system right. Uh, and so that was sort of the, the starting point there. But again, like it was helpful for us to start thinking a little bit um, in terms of an agenda. Now, how to be, I don't know, how to try to best prepare yourself. So I think it's important to be like a broad economist. So don't just follow your own field, but try to be like broadly interested. So like conferences like these are like really fantastic uh, because you can follow, like you can go to lots of different sessions uh, that are not like squarely in your field. You can walk over to the other hotel and sort of like, like see what, what other economists are working on. I think it's important to realize that there's a lot of arbitrage opportunities across, across fields. Uh, sometimes what may help, at least in my experience, uh, for some of the work that I've done on like, like um, on the interaction between finance, macro and health economics, is to like team up with like someone else in another field. So that's like a really fast way to learn and that really helped me a lot actually uh, to get into like health economics. Um, the other thing that uh, I think you have to realize is that, uh, or what is useful I think, is to be aware of the history of thought. Like, like how did like a literature reach like a certain consensus? And I think in that context, it's useful to keep in mind that literatures often develop in a very nonlinear way. And so um, in the context of asset demand systems, uh, there's actually a nice example of that. Because if you go back to the 60s and 70s uh, by the work, the work of like Friedman and Tobin, what they were doing was really demand system asset pricing. That was kind of the natural sort of like follow up after you did the CAPM and so on. Uh, but then they didn't have like the, the data that we have nowadays, they didn't have the methodology. And so the estimates that they got were like uh, uh, not very uh, interpretable. And so then people figured out, well, we can do factor models and we don't really need to have like all these, uh, all this, uh, the struggle with the holdings data. And that's sort of how the literature progressed. But that wasn't really sort of the natural starting point. And so it was sort of natural to revisit that. And it's kind of interesting. Let me just sort of like mention one paper that is it's kind of a, it's, a, it's a beautiful paper actually uh, by Friedman in the, in the JF in, in 1978, which if someone would write it now, I think you, you would have a good chance publishing it again, um, which is like, like he's asking the question, like who puts the inflation premium uh, into, the, into the yield curve? And so it's kind of like the question, like who's driving break even inflation rates, like which investors are important for that? Uh, and so current demand systems could be used for that question. And so these questions were explored like, like many, many uh, decades ago. And so, um, so I think it's useful to sort of like understand like where literatures like came from, like why certain decisions were made and whether those were like the right ones. 
Um, I think as an empiricist, like perhaps stating the obvious, I think it's important to be familiar with like theory and, and, and vice versa. Uh, if you're an empiricist, there's so much like method, so many like methodological advances in other fields and, and not necessarily in finance, but they're very useful for finance. And so being aware of those methodological advances, I think is, is, is very helpful as well because it may give you new ideas. I think it's really helpful to be extremely tooled up uh, along that dimension. Um, so to, to Marcus's point, like on risk taking, uh, so I think it's important to take risks. I think there's like so many open uh, basic questions that we don't know the answer to. Um, that like sometimes people argue that finance is a very mature field, which may be true for some questions. At the same time, I feel there's like so much we don't understand. Um, and so I, I think we really need to sort of be uh, willing to take like bold, like to explore like bold new approaches. And I think it's important to take risks. Um, and so if, if existing models or approaches seem unconvincing to you, if you'd like reflect on the models and look at like the world out there, like does it make sense? Uh, then start start exploring alternatives. Like don't be afraid to disrupt or, or challenge existing like paradigms. Now that can cause some headaches in the short run um, in terms of like going against like what other people have done. It may raise a lot of questions, uh, that's fine. Um, and so some of the challenges that you, you may run into um, is that when you start exploring new ideas and approaches, um, I think the following points are kind of important to keep in mind. Is that when you try to do something like that's very different, um, the first version that you're gonna write down or even the first version that you publish, uh, it's not gonna be as perfect as this sort of like existing paradigm. And the reason is that like, so the existing models that we all work with, they look like they're like perfectly polished. There's like, even though it may not make an awful lot of sense in certain dimensions, there's like perfect answers for like every hard question. And we all agree that like, okay, the model doesn't do great on that, but that's kind of the answer and we go with that. If you go up with something new, then like people are very quick to point out like all the 17 flaws because we don't have answers to those yet. Um, but like, like when you sort of explore something new, it's, it's, it's sort of like typically a bit more like rough uh, 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 at the beginning. And then it sort of progresses over time. And so you may experience sort of like more resistance in conferences, seminars, and, and at journals. Um, but it's sort of, I know my advice would be to take, take that criticism in stride and, and just try to address it as much as possible. Because even if you get like really hard, confusing questions, it really helps you to improve your paper uh, and maybe give you ideas for like the next paper. So you may start like simple with like a static model with like a lot of like, like, like assumptions and then gradually you can build it out, can build it out over time. Now here, um, working with co-authors is extremely valuable. Uh, so the work on, on, on insurance and asset demand systems now with Modo and, and Xavier Gebex, uh, it's, it's really great to work with like very, very uh, good co-authors who also like are excited about what you're doing uh, if you get pushback. So I don't know, try not to be very easily discouraged. This is how science works. Ultimately, we have to get to the, to the truth and um, that sometimes may be a bumpy ride. So where to start? So um, I think this is the hardest part and I think you have to find your own way. Like I think um, everyone has their own way of like getting to ideas. Uh, being aware of like broad trends in terms of like like what's going on in the economy and the industry and literatures will obviously help you. Uh, the one thing that I think may be useful is to sort of like pay attention to like, I don't know what I'm gonna refer to as like the tip of the iceberg. So um, like our first paper on insurance started with like a very small observation on a small set of contracts that seemed to be mispriced. We thought so the most sensible sort of like interpretation of that was like like frictions in terms of like financial constraints. And so that sort of like led to the whole, uh, to like a much longer uh, agenda. Uh, and even though the agenda may be path dependent, I think it started with like a small observation thinking about what the broader implications were. And so just to make that maybe tangible in the current context, um, you can sort of think about like what happened to UK pension funds like a, a couple of weeks ago. And you may sort of think, well, there was sort of like a, a bunch of pension funds who had some like LDI structures. They were hedging uh, some bonds or some derivatives. They got margin calls. Um, and that sort of like led to some disruption in the, in, in the government bond market and the Bank of England had to step in and that was kind of like a one-off event. So that would be like I know, one, one way of thinking about that event. You could also sort of like wonder, well, why was liquidity management so poor for these pension funds? Um, or then taking a step back and say like, well, they're not the only long-term investors out there. So there's a lot of other long-term investors in, uh, in other countries. There's like insurance companies, there's like pension funds. And could these things happen more globally uh, if interest rates suddenly start to rise? or sort of like taking even a step further back is that we've seen like, like a, a secular decline sort of over like a 40 year period. And maybe um, the financial sort of industry has sort of like has been rewired in a way that it operates like really well when interest rates are stable and gradually declining, but maybe it like build in sort of like some vulnerabilities if interest rates suddenly like snap up. Um, and there's like a risk sort of hidden there that we didn't realize before. 
And so people have explored this, like in some of Marcus's work, of course, that if you have a period where there's like volatility is very low, then like investors may like lever up and that may set you up for like a more fragile period. Maybe what we have seen with interest rates is like a very long secular decline. And that may have like rewired the industry, different parts of the financial sector, like banks, insurance companies, uh, and so on, to sort of like operate in that environment where interest rates can't rise very rapidly. And maybe there's a lot of like hidden risk if that, if that changes. And so suddenly sort of like a whole sort of like set of question, questions opens up, which just starts from like one observation that a couple of like UK pension funds uh, didn't do their liquidity management like all that well. Okay, and so, so I think it's sort of useful to start from like small observations and see like is there something bigger going on or not. Um, the answer may be, well, this was just a small event uh, in some cases. Uh, in other cases, it actually may open up, open up a new agenda. The last sort of like comment I want to make is that is that you have to realize that I think data are endogenous. Uh, like we have Johannes here, who's like the world expert on this. Um, but oftentimes, like like when we started with our work on asset demand systems, like we just used like standard data that was available. But then once the framework was available to sort of like study holdings data and equilibrium, we got data from like the European Central Bank. We got like other regulatory data. Now we got like data from private companies on like wealthy individuals and so on. So suddenly, once the frameworks are available, actually data. Um, um, is often also like much more available than at least I anticipated uh, when we started. And so it's useful to sort of be very entrepreneurial in these things and, um, and see what, what you can get your hands on. Thank you. All right, well, thanks a lot for including me uh, in the session. Um, as uh, Ralph anticipated, um, there's probably gonna be quite some overlap, although it might be interesting to see also where we differ and which gives you a taste for one thing you, which you said, Ralph, which is ultimately you have to find your own way. We are kind of sharing our personal experiences here. So it's definitely flavored by this. So like, like Ralph, I would like to a kind of, you know, when, when Marcus asked me this question, can I serve in this panel on how to come up with great research ideas? Um, you know, I paused and said, well, what is great research? And so he, I think, uh, distinguished between several categories. I just putting, putting it into two. Yeah, number one, the perspective of your um, promotion and tenure committee, you know, what gets you tenure, what gets you promoted, what gets you to kind of advance on your career. And then I'm kind of contrasting that, although I will emphasize that it does not have to be a contrast always, but I do want to contrast it um, with the perspective of advancing science and improving the world. And um, so number one, we kind of understand. So we are, we're looking for strategies to max our number of top five econ or top three finance journals. Um, number two, uh, we want to maximize the probability that we make um, our colleagues, for starters, the profession, think differently about what's interesting, important research, how to uh, approach different research. We want to move science forward and ultimately have an impact on policy making and real world decision making. And so there is some conflict. And for, for many of us at the beginning of our career, it does make sense maybe to focus on number one, because, you know, you, you do, you do want to advance, but I will urge you not to lose track, not to, you know, lose out of, better, let out of your mind the perspective uh, of number two. So the approach number one, let's maximize our, our top lab publications, kind of what I've seen work a lot, kind of can maybe be boiled down to three main approaches I see. So an important one is um, in particular in this day and age, you bring in new data. So I hope Johannes will be kind of talking a little bit about that. So it, it might be that you're the one who first established the connection to the Facebook person. And now you're sitting there and you have this access, you have this, this gold mine and you're writing lots of fantastic papers um, about it. And um, uh, people are just curious to, I mean, we are social scientists afterwards. They're curious to learn about the world. If you can do that, if you can do a paper that doesn't use yet again, CompuSat, CRISP, et cetera, um, that's great. You get kind of a big bonus for that. Um, and it is kind of right now, I would say over the last five, 10 years, it has been the area of measurement. So in econ and finance, right? You have a Raschetti, you kind of get access, ha having unique access to all sorts of administrative data sets and writing lots of papers of what's having, happening, lots of different census tracts and commuting zones. Um, there's a Facebook example. There are many examples. Oh, there are all the, our Scandinavian friends who have like amazing uh, data sets and we all want to be friends and co-authors with them and, and, and write these papers. And um, that is rewarded. And um, that's a good way to kind of ensure, like as you're going through the refereeing process and um, also be, uh, being put on programs and being read and being noticed um, that, that, that you have the entry. Um, not everything about that is great, 
uh, in my mind, it increases inequality. If you are the guy who asked for the data first and, and God has the access, you know, you run the show. Part of it is a fair reward for that. Part of it, you know, it's easier for, I guess, all of us are sitting at, you know, pretty rich, I mean, Berkeley is poor, but fine, with pretty like high level universities and kind of uh, tend to have these opportunities others don't have. So I hope the profession continues to think critically um, about that, but that is a brilliant time for that. It, it was always the case, it is right now. Number two is, you know, you bring in new tools and if I want to start from new theory tools. So, you know, that's how Merton, you know, he brought in all the ETUS, ETUS statistic and so on, ETUS lemma, et cetera. So it made us rethink um, how to do stuff in finance. More recently, my former colleague Yuri uh, Sanikov, you know, basically taught us all, let's go away from our discrete time thinking, let's go to more continuous time and then we see really what's going on. And then you use that tool and you get a lot of attention for that. You can write a lot of papers about that. So you bring in, um, I don't know, as Parak would say, you know, like that's what we mathematicians do. We bring in our tricks of like math, I mean, theorists would do, and then kind of rewrite um, kind of how research was done. And then one I'm most familiar with uh, kind of personally is like uh, to try and bring in a new empirical tool. So for example, uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Chris Walters and Pat Klein, um, are working on um, discrimination, discrimination in firms, uh, running audit studies. You might say, oh, isn't that pretty old? Since the 1980s, we have audit studies in firms which try to identify discrimination. Yes. And um, first of all, they're doing it better and the interventions are better designed, but also they bring in a new econometric tool kind of to distributionally identify uh, within an organization when there must be um, discrimination going on. Or like to to kind of cite one of the things I've been doing with 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 um, Mark Brockschuld and Miles Günzel and Sanya Leo is we um, we uh, we were you know we're working a lot with computer scientists and data scientists and we're using um, tools of uh, visual machine learning to kind of identify stress and and aging and um, so you know that certainly gets you some interest and attention. Now, um, what I'm claiming here is that what I see in terms of landing um, top publications that. To my dismay, <laughs> um, sometimes the research question can almost be secondary, and with that I mean it doesn't need to be novel, it doesn't need to be earth-shattering, but just bringing in the green tools, the cool new data, etc. You can land a topic. Of course, it doesn't have to be secondary, right? So it, it, you, you can work on areas you care about, you think are important about, but I, I just um, feel that kind of if you want to understand the truth of what lands in these um, top journals, then, you know, you have all been referees, right? Like, so you kind of, you go through the paper, you don't like something, but then if there's this new thing, this new data or this new tool or this new kind of elegant mass that kind of just might lift the refer referee over the hurdle. And that's, I think, what we see in practice a lot uh, in the top journals. But it doesn't have to be that way. So, I mean, you can care about the topic. You can work on important topics and work on advancing science. So in some sense, the only difference in, in my mind of approach too is that's kind of where you start from. You start from what topics do I care about? What topics do I think are important? What are novel questions? And it often nicely correlates, I mean, with what gets you excited because, you know, it's not the fifth, 50th paper about some refinement of dynamic capital structure theory, which, which might be a great improvement over the previous one, but it kind of you end this narrow field, but something completely out of the box can really get your juices flowing. So I recommend it also for that reason, because it's a marathon, not a sprint. We, we need our, our, our occasional motivation. Um, but, but that's it pretty much. Then you still want ideally the novel data, the novel techniques, et cetera, et cetera. It's kind of just that you're, you're starting from there. And I'm gonna get back to the benefits of doing that in a second. Now, but I do want to openly talk about the conflicts. Um, so one was brought up already. Um, so there might be risk. There's, there's a lot, of, there's risk involved in writing novel research in particular, if it might contradict previous approaches. So for example, if there were like decades of research looking at mergers and acquisitions, um, many of which are greeted by the market with an abnormal negative stock market reaction and a long literature has tried to rationalize why CEOs still do that. And then you come along and say, no, actually the CEOs are biased. So, you know, I've worked in overconfident, CEOs are overconfident, that's why they do that. Well, the paper will be sent to referees who are quite vested in these previous views about asymmetric information or an incentive misalignment explaining everything. So it will make your life hard. Um, I do think, I do regret that unfortunately our refereeing process inherently um, leads a little bit to kind of a disadvantage of these kind of disrupting, disruptive type, type of work. Um, 
And then there is, I mean, that's maybe a little bit later in, in, in your career. Um, um, there are also situations where it's maybe not ideal if you really want to advance science to have the top five, top three perspective for which you need the cool new data, the cool new technique, et cetera. So for my uh, own, um, for my own agenda, um, I think many of you, some of you have seen, like I, I've been doing this work on experience effects, much of it's with Stefan Nagel, where we kind of fundamentally say there's a lot of power to our past. The past stays with that and influences our views and our decision making um, beyond what economists have been willing to acknowledge. So if you're trying to predict some variable y t, consumption at time t, and it, traditionally you think, oh, if I just get the whole vector x of your current income, wealth, whatever, ex education, et cetera, maybe also some forward-looking variables if you want, I'm good it doesn't matter how I got here, <clears throat> um, then we come in and say, no, we want the whole matrix with including all the past realizations. And we think this is really powerful in predicting what you weigh how. So the past, whether you got to where you are being born with a silver spoon in the mouth versus you worked your way up from poverty will, will influence um, what fears and expectations you have for the futures and what decisions you're willing to take. And so, Stefan and I were very lucky that we got like a first applications like thinking about stock market ex investment based on your past stock market experiences and one about inflation expectations based on your personal exposure to inflation into a top journal. And so I think um, now the approach one is to think, okay, what do I do slightly different? Where do I have a really novel data set? Um, where, where do I do something kind of that deviates significant enough to cross the hurdle again? However, you might also care about really teasing out how general that is. Like, should we rewrite all of economics? Always, if we can, get all the available data on what you have been exposed to in the past. And do we think it's quite general that it has very strong predictive power above and beyond the, the usual variables? If you do that, if you're really driven to kind of try and test that, uh, challenge that, and possibly establish that, then you're going maybe to, you know, towards writing a paper in the journal International Economics, where it's about international data, or monetary economics, and I mean, and, or labor economics and so on, because I mean, which is of course all great outlets still, but um, what I'm trying to say is it's, it's a little different from the game you're playing um, to just get in the top journal. So rather than a game, you're kind of really focused on understanding how general it is. And you might, you might hit that, that threshold. And it relates a little bit to what Ralph was saying about the insurance market, really fully understanding things. Sometimes it comes along with bringing in really novel views, maybe from related to IO, which like, which kind of can revolutionize how we, how we think about this market. But then sometimes you want to really test out how it works, fully establish it. And that might not be the top five, top three, uh, maximization. So, um, I, I'm going to get back to the possible payoffs of that on my last slide, but one more um, slide before is, of course, how do you get to these novel ideas? Um, good news is if you're on the, on the younger side, right, you're doing your PhD, you're just coming out of the PhD, you're not still completely blinded yet by having been exposed to too many conferences and seeing what all the other people do, in particular the, the senior and favor, uh, 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 famous ones. Um, keep that, you know, the perspective you're bringing from outside, from, from your life outside, I, I think is, is very valuable. Um, now, an advice you often get is, well, observe what's going on in the world around you, what's important, you know, financial crisis started, and then all of a sudden, um, I had all the students who just wanted to do microfinance stuff with me, when before I'd had lots of corporate uh, st students uh, working with me. So, that's valuable, and so the cor cor corollary of read the FT, uh, Wall Street Journal Economist, of course, makes sense. Personally, you know, sharing my personal experience, um, I found it to be quite valuable to try and bring in a little bit of an outside perspective. Um, that's often like an interdisciplinary perspective, if, if you want. Um, uh, so, for example, I, I, before I did a PhD in, in econ, I did one in law, actually Roman law at, at that. And um, the, the, the picture of the humans, how they make decisions and how they're driven by emotions and make mistakes and, and, and all of that was so important in, 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 in assessing situations played no role at the time in the world where I was studying like a, you know, mechanism design, contract theory, very rational work, world, which I loved and which I thought I would end, end up in. But there was this conflict and I'm wrestling with that. And then I'm getting to know behavioral economics, psychology and economics, and that kind of brings me to look at things differently. And I feel I've seen that over and over again. So in behavioral economics, it is bringing in social psychology. Um, then there are 
like a couple of people working in neurofinance, um, neuro neuroeconomics, and working on different type of models, which are famous there, like DDM, I mean, drift diffusion um, type models. Um, right now, I think the most exciting things are happening at the cross with com computer science and data science. My best undergraduate students are from there. I'm you know, now writing letters for people in kind of both disciplines. I'm collaborating with people. So, like, wrestling with people who have different tools and different views and trying to see what benefit we go could both have from that, I think, is, is, is potentially has a very high payoff. And I was actually kind of assured when I was, um, I was reading this book by Walter Isaacson, um, The Code Breaker, about Jennifer Doudna and yeah, CRISPR technology and, and winning the Nobel Prize. And he was actually talking about um, Darwin in the book. And, um, and no, he was quoting Isaac Asimov. I don't know whether any of you read science fiction, um, who's also a biochemistry professor. And what he thinks, how progress can be made, how Darwin came up with his ideas. And it was really interesting to see like how he was explaining. Well, he read Malthus about population growth and explosion and people dying out and the fittest kind of surviving, if you want, a population subgroup. And that really influenced his evolutionary theories. So I think like um, learning, getting to know some neighboring fields, assuming the perspective, wrestling with it, um, in my mind, is something that really pays off um, for the big changes. So. Um, let me conclude with a pitch for like approach two. So I told you approach one is, I guess, you know, what we maybe all have in our mind at, our, at the beginning of our careers to make it through here. Um, but don't leave out of your sight completely approach two of trying to advance science and find the truth and, 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 and improve the world. For starters, I would say, you know, if you want to reach for the stars, it's, it's not necessarily the number of top fives or top threes. So when you look at how the Clark Bates Medal or Fisher Black Prize is, is given, people are always asking, okay, where did this person really change the field or introduce a new field? Um, like, is influencing what the next generations um, are, are doing? And that's kind of um, uh, good to keep in mind because the mean counting is so often emphasized. Second, you know, to keep you going for the long run, I think this can be super helpful. I mean, I have too many colleagues so after some years just do some consulting or earn their money with, with finance firms. And there's nothing bad about that, about exposure to the real world. But you really feel they lost their fire for science. And it's so great, uh, the, the field we are in. So continuing to care about science, care about the truth, shaking up beliefs, having this engaging discussion can really pay off. And that's more approach too. And then I think that also leads to more long run happiness um, where, you know, you're not kind of dried out and kind of just keep going through the motions because that's the job you have. That's what you're hired for. But you realize what a privilege it is to kind of to, to be in science. I'll stop with that. So I'm going to take a slightly uh, different approach to um, thinking about this topic of coming up with research ideas and finance. And I'm going to think about it specifically from the context of a style of research that, you know, Ulrike, you know, has already mentioned, which is sort of, you know, doing academic research in collaboration with, with private firms, which I think is something that, um, you know, we've seen grow dramatically over the past decade, but it brings along a whole like different set of both opportunities, but also challenges to thinking about how to structure your research, how to develop, um, you know, research agendas and so on. So I want to try and sort of provide some thoughts on this. I'm going to talk both about a little bit about the mechanics of these types of collaborations, because I think once you understand what the challenges of them are, you get a better sense of how they might influence um, the, the, the project choice. Um, this is going to be based on some of my own experience of you know, having sort of longer running collaborations with both Meta, Facebook, um, Vanguard, and other firms. Um, but I want to emphasize something that, uh, you know, that, that others already said, which is, look, this is going to be one set of views. Um, it's something that worked for me, but what works for me might not work for other people. And so you want to get lots of people's views. You're getting three people's views today. But I think you want to talk to your classmates, to your advisors, et cetera, hear many views, and in the end, develop your own path. I, I, you know, I think the common theme, and I think this was kind of the reaction from Ralph and I, is literally like, how do you come up with research ideas? There, it's not like one way. And so getting lots of different perspectives of, of, of this from different people, I think, is is very helpful. Um, 
So why do I think um, we've seen this dramatic growth of um, research being done, um, you know, with firm data and, you know, to, to some extent in collaboration with private sector firms? Um, I think it's a result of a, you know, a confluence of a bunch of trends. So if you could look back, say, 25 years ago, you know, economics was, a, you know, a much more so than today, a largely theoretical field, and it became more empirical over time, um, starting initially working with more aggregate data, then working with more micro data sets, but you know, until about 10, 15 years ago, most of the micro data sets were administrative data sets, maybe provided by, you know, a government agency, a regulator or something like that. And I think in the last 10 years, you know, in part um, as a result of the dramatic growth of the tech sector, um, we've seen that, you know, much of the interesting data is increasingly no longer collected by governments, but it is collected by firms. And I think that provides a whole range of opportunities for firms. And by firms, I really mean both very big firms such as Facebook, but also very small firms, startups, fintech firms, et cetera, to collaborate with, with researchers to produce um, public facing academic research. Now, why do I think these opportunities are there? I mean, I think you know, quite often new data sets just allow you to answer questions that were just were impossible to think about before. When it's a new data set, or Rika hinted at this a little bit, sometimes even the summary statistics are interesting. I would, you know, it's a, it, you know, take online social networks, it's something we didn't know very much about. It's a large part of our lives. So even just a rough understanding of the summary statistics can, can kind of be informative for people. Um, firms have both a willingness and an infrastructure to actually do a lot of interventions. They can run surveys. They can conduct experiments in the tech sector. They do a lot of A-B testing as part of their day-to-day -day business anyways. So I think there's a lot of opportunities within the data sets and within these collaborations to create your own data. There's also, as a result, lots of already existing quasi-random variation that's collected. Right again, you know, like every one of your Facebook feeds is going to look different because of you know ru constantly running thousands of different versions of the ranking algorithm in parallel. Well, each of these might provide you with exogenous variation that that you can exploit. Um, and I think one thing that we shouldn't underestimate is collaborations with firms um, can help your teaching and your research, and can help that stay relevant. You know, Ulrike mentioned this. Just look around you. What, what's going on in the world around you? Well, when you working on research projects with individuals at firms, you naturally talk to them very frequently. You hear about what's going on in their worlds, and I think that can be quite quite relevant to, to, to shape research. So, so what questions do you go, right? This is kind of the big question. Like how do you come up with the questions? Um, so my sense is there's sort of different valid approaches to coming up with research questions. You know, you can think about the data-driven or the question-driven approach. The data-driven approach is like, I'm just going to try and get the biggest, most novel data set I can get my hands on. And I don't care up front about what the question is, and then I'm going to try and look what the question allows me to do. The alternative is you're question driven. You have something specific, and you go and look for the very data that you, you can do. My sense is that projects with firm data are more often than not much more in this data driven part um, than other parts of economics and finance. And I think that's at least two to at least two reasons. One of them, it's quite hard up front to know really what do the firms have, what sources of variation exist. So, really defining what questions you can answer is actually quite hard up front until you actually get stuck in. The second thing, and this is something uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep emphasizing throughout, is the failure rate and what called the acquisition funnel of running these projects. You're going to be contacting, you know, I'm going to talk about how to establish you know, collaboration, how to start these discussions with firms, but in principle, you're going to be contacting hundreds of firms, and that's going to lead to potentially one project. You don't have the time up front to think of a well thought through, you know, clear research agenda for each one of the firms you're going to contact at the point of contact, right? Because that takes time to think through very carefully. And so given that, you know, you're going to send so many cold emails that lead to some calls, you know, and then every call and then more lawyers get involved. And then, you know, at various stages, these, you know, these things can, can fall apart. Um, that means that you know, it, it, it might only become worth your while thinking really carefully about what to do very late into sort of trying to, uh, to get a collaboration started. Um, now, you obviously need to have some general interest in the type of data firms collect, right? So you say, I, you know, if I find social network and, 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 you know, and, and social interactions as a source of, you know, of interesting you know, variation in behavior boring, then don't talk to Facebook. If you, you know, find you know, in how individuals invest boring, don't talk to Vanguard, right? So you need this basic interest. But beyond that, I think you need to be really open-minded about the types of questions that you pursue. And I think, um, you know, this is maybe a little bit of a, of a counterpoint to what Ulrike said. She said, well, then you send something to the Journal of International Economics. And I think that's, in some sense, that's a sensible approach, but it might be a bit risky for early career researchers. In some sense, because, you know, 
in some sense, it just depends on who the eventual committee is that, that, that is going to evaluate you. So I think that is something important to keep in mind, right? That um, now, the other thing that this, and this gels nicely, but some of the things that Ralph said is you want to think of, you know, these collaborations with firms as really driving an agenda, right? The fixed cost of getting something off the ground that's just so high is going to be several years of work before you're ever going to see the first bit of data. It's going to be so high that it's just not a good use of your time if you're going to write one, maybe two papers out of this, right? You really need to think about how this will allow you to do, uh, to do more than that. Okay, so how do you find firms interested in collaborations? To be honest, I think, you know, my experience, but also the experience of, of many other people that I observe, um, you know, who, who do this type of work, and as you all know, in finance, in particular with the fintech firms, has become pretty, pretty prominent, is through personal networks, right? A lot of your, you know, your grad school classmates might end up going to an Uber or a Facebook or a, you know, a Mint or something like that. Your advisors might know people, you know, their graduate students of the past decades might be there. So I think personal networks are, in some sense, the most promising source. But even if you don't have that, it is not necessary to have it. Cold emailing does work. It does work as a graduate student. I uh, send a cold email to, uh, to Trulia, which eventually got acquired by Zillow as a, you know, a, a real large online real estate um, listing service. There were about 30 people at the time, and I sent probably about 100 emails, and three firms got back to me, and Zillow, uh, Trulia was one of them. And you know, I had no real contact to anyone inside of the firm, um, but it's a numbers game. Right? Again, this acquisition funnel, you can't send five emails and then get frustrated or disappointed if you don't hear back and you say, well, this isn't going to work out. You, know, you really have to do this. And it's important at that point to figure out how you add value. And we're going to talk about that in a slide or two, like what's in it for the firms. Because in many ways, how you approach them and how you design the types of research questions you do, you have to realize there's another partner on the other end that you have to convince to go along with you and it's going to take them financial resources, time resources, etc. They're going to take some potentially non-trivial reputational risk, et cetera, got to understand what's in it for them. And that, to some extent, might shape how you think about the agenda and the types of questions. So you need to understand how you add value. You should be very, very broad in the type of proposals you're making, right? I've seen people write these emails that I want to exactly answer this question, and this is the regression I want to run with your data. And like the person who sent the email might just not care at all about that specific question. But this is the way like, you, know, you think about research when you've spent like, you know, three years reading papers. But someone at a firm, you just want like some broad themes of the types of things that you want to look at. And again, you know, if you, if you are very specific, anyone who happens to not be interested in that specific thing, you immediately say, this is not for me. If you keep it broad, I think that can be helpful. Um, even for a cold email, find people inside the firm that understand the value of research. Here, we've seen this tremendous increase of firms hiring economists, not just you know, the tech firms, you know, with Amazon, et cetera. But, you know, PhD economists are now found all across, um, you know, all across firms. You know, and, and even if they chose to leave academia and go into industry, they understand the value of it. They might be quite curious to do a little project on the side and so on. So spend time on LinkedIn, find these people and, you know, and approach them. You know, maybe you can find people inside the firm that you have some link to, some friend of a friend or something. But again, be prepared for disappointment. Again, the ratio of contact to uh, you know, to a successful project, I think is about a hundred to one. Um, okay, so what's in it for the firm? Because I really think this is really central to thinking about questions. Because it's not enough to have a question; you need to have a question where you can con convince another partner to invest significant resources to pursue it with you. And I think there's two types of things that are in it for firms that can drive this type of decision. The first one is what I call topic-related interest. Right? It might actually be that the type of research topic you're interested in studying might itself be of interest to the partner firm, but there's no internal skills or internal resources available to pursue these questions. So with Trulia, it was a small firm, again, with 30 people at the time, they're like, these are interesting questions. We don't have the resources or justification to hire a full-time data scientist for a 30-person firm to do this. So if you're willing to do it for free, all the better, we'll do it together. Um, so it's great if you can have that. One thing you need to be careful about, and I think it's probably the most tricky part of this entire style of doing research, which is while you need to ideally find questions that the firm is interested in, you need to find questions where the firm does not have a vested interest in one answer or another. Right? And the reason is that you can't credibly answer them. Say if I was gonna go and propose to Facebook that we're gonna study how effective is targeted advertising, right? What if I find that it's extremely effective? Facebook would like that, but if I go here and present that, everyone's like, well, sure, you're gonna find that, otherwise they wouldn't let you publish what you find, and so on. 
if I find that it's not effective, you know, then I have this weird situation. Now, even if we have a contract that says I can publish whatever I want, and I'll get to that in a bit, you definitely need that type of contract. I mean, the thing, I've invested a ton in the relationship, I put out this paper, well, that's the end of the relationship, right? And so when you, when you, when you go and try and do questions where the partner firm has a vested interest in finding A versus B, you can't do it credibly. And so you stay away from these questions, even if they might be the most interesting ones. So manage potential conflicts over findings through question selection. And this is not great. In some sense, ideally, all the data in the world would be freely available for research and we would all just do it. That's just not how this works. What you need to avoid is creating a research finding that then, for some reason, you can't go public with. I think that's like, you know, I think a big ethical red line. But to me, the only way to avoid that is to be extremely careful at the beginning in terms of picking question where you couldn't come up with a reason of why the other party would care about finding A or B. So, you know, just give some examples from my own recent work. You know, I've done work with, with Raj Chetty, Teresa Kuchel, and Matt Jackson, where we've studied social capital together with Facebook. So we've measured different types of social capital to study which one was more predictive of upward economic mobility. And it's like how to imagine Facebook caring all that much whether or not this type of social capital or that type of social capital matters more. You know, I'm more close to the finance world. You know, we've written a paper about how do mutual fund managers use social networks to invest. Again, not something where they really have a strong interest one way or the other, but it does take some, some questions um, off the table. And, you know, you really need to balance the firm interest with academic interest. That's kind of the other thing. There might be questions the firm cares a lot about, aren't of general academic interest. And so trying to find the balance there, um, I think, might be tricky. So then you can do the types of questions where the firm doesn't have all that much of an interest in, right? And, and I think those might sometimes be the most interesting one from an academic perspective. So how do you get someone to invest resources and time in a collaboration where they don't actually care all that much about the specific question? So I think there's a bunch of value propositions to you know, a, a firm that you can make. The first one is broader interactions with the research team may be extremely beneficial to the partner firm. You bring a lot of expertise to the table, you know. Employees can learn a ton of skills from collaborating with you. Looking at the data, you're going to find things, you're going to find mistakes, because the way that we're trained as empiricists to look at data is very different to the way that, say, you know, computer engineers, uh, you know, software engineers are trained to look at data. So you're going to find things that's going to be very valuable for them. And then most firms, at least until recently, are trying to recruit. And so it's a great way to get to know, you know, get to know talent and, and bring it into the firm. So I think that's something that you can sell. Um, supporting research may be generally valued by partner firms. Um, you know, employees and potential future employees value participating in research, right? So tech tries to hire a lot of PhD economists. And one of the great things that PhD economists like is research. So if it's a firm that generally supports research, that helps them attract, you know, talent in the, in the job market even if that talent doesn't spend most of their time themselves doing research, but it's an environment that's appealing. Um, and then there's some firms, you know, and I think a lot of this depends on, you know, someone very senior who just views this as a nice way for social engagement. There's an aspect of public image management there with firms. So, you know, firms like Facebook have, you know, what they call data for good teams, not just Facebook, um, you know, the JP Morgan Institute, you know, a bunch of examples like that of where firms are actively using collaborations with academics where they use the data for sort of social good questions to, to you know, improve their image. And, you know, there may be sort of a variety of, you know, of a positive media coverage that comes as well. So it's not just that firms are necessarily have to be interested in the exact question you have, but you have all of these other things that you can try and sell to them as, as part of this, um, as part of collaboration. Now, how do you collaborate? I mean, to be honest, in the end, the details are unique to each each relationship. There isn't like a blanket, you know, uh, template to follow. Um, you know, you, you need to balance the interests of the firm, right, which are basically maximize these benefits above with different weights and need to figure out which firms cares about which of these things more. Um, you know, with, with an interest to maintain control of the data and, you know, control the release of potentially sensitive information. Um, and then as a researcher, you need to find questions that are of general academic interest. And again, that doesn't necessarily include all of the questions that the firms find interesting. Um, you need to balance your very strong interest in academic freedom. You cannot make publication conditional on results. And again, I, to be honest, I think the only credible way to get there is to, to be sort of you know, judicious in your selection of questions you ask in the first place. And then you need to think about your career concerns, which is you need to public in, publish in academic journals. And importantly, you know, we know review cycles can sometimes take many years. So there has to be a way of like maintaining 
setting the relationship on a footing where the data access doesn't at some point dry up when you have to do a revision or something like that, right? So these are, these are the types of things. So I'm gonna have like just a few sort of last thoughts on this. Um, you know, I think you wanna formalize the review process early on and describe conditions of publication of any. I think that needs to be formalized. So it has to be, you know, the firm will usually insist on no private information being revealed. But it should be very, very clear sort of what set of conditions, um, you know, potentially constitute a reason for the firm to say in this form, the paper can't go out. And it has to be a timeline. You know, you send the paper and then have X many days for you to get back. Um, you want to talk with the firm about how much they actually want to be involved in the execution of the project. And there's a whole range of some firms I'll give you the data, but I don't have time to do anything with it. And then there's others where the people inside who actually want to be on the weekly calls. Right, and they want to be involved and so on. So you need to figure that out. Um, you need to be prepared again for extremely long timelines. Between initial contact, some agreement you get when you first get access, then you spend a year trying to understand the data because it's so, so messy and so on. You do the research, you have the first paper you publish. There can be many, many years in between this. And it's really important not just to be aware of this yourself and kind of you know, judge this against any sort of deadlines, timelines, et cetera you have, but also make the firm aware of that. Because for them, the idea is like, man, Johannes has been at this for like nine months and we still haven't seen a paper. Like, what's going on? Like, is there anything happening? You know, like just be upfront right from the start that this is something where like, we might be at this for like two years and we haven't seen a paper yet. And that doesn't mean we're not making process. It's just, that's how it works. And it's, you know, and, 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 and so that's important. Um, I think one thing, while it is valuable to try and have sort of formal agreements with firms upfront, I think the central thing is you cannot pre-specify everything. You're not gonna write a complete contingent contract. And so the central aspect in all of this working is you find some way of establishing a trust relationship with some individuals inside of the firm that allow you to work out you know, reasonable solutions to any of those aspects where that are just non-contractable upfront, right? And so ideally you find some champion inside the firm, but, but really, you know, this is about relationship management as much as anything else. And I guess this is my last sort of general point here, which is realize that relationship management is as important to the success of these types of things. And relationship management, I think, between you and the people inside the firm, these are, you know, human beings. And in the end, without building up some trust, um, it's not going to work, right? And so that, you know, getting that right is as important as finding the right research question and something like that. Um, two last things that I think can be very helpful. I think the one is, However much you can make aggregated or anonymized versions of your data publicly available. Um, I think it, first of all, you know, Ralph talked a lot, a lot about these different types of, 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 of impact. I mean, if you want other people to work in the field, you know, quite often, not everyone who wants to work in a field can replicate the same type of relationship that you have with a firm. It's just not possible, it just doesn't scale. Um, and yet you want follow on people to do work that builds on it or that works in the same space, right? It's kind of boring to be the only one working in a space because, you know, data restrictions are there. Um, and so, um, and so that's it. The second benefit is, is, I guess, to addressing a little bit Ulrika's concern, which is there is inequality in this to some extent, right? Like not everybody, you know, has the friend at this firm and so on gets the data. You reduce that a little bit by, by you know, by being sort of judicious about what types of data can possibly be released that other people can then work with, et cetera. Um, and it also alleviates possible concerns about lack of replicability in, 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 in any type of results with firm data, right? We now have at the various journals, including the JF, you know, requirements to publicly post data and so on, um, you know, and, and those are important, but they don't work with firm data, right? You're not gonna be able to post microdata on anything, but maybe a subset of the results, you know, are replicable with more aggregated data. And so the more you can do there, the more you can kind of manage um, potentially very legitimate concerns that people have, but how do I know that there isn't just a coding bug in here? Like, how do I know that, that, that this is sort of a robust set of replicable things? So two examples of this that, you know, we've done as part of the relationship with Facebook, you know, we've released a, you know, a data set that we call the social connectedness index, which is basically a data set on the strength of the social network between every US zip code, you know, every country, every zip code equivalent in every country. So it's a huge matrix of the probability of two individuals across these two places 
being connected with each other socially. And, you know, we put out this data set about 18 months ago and, you know, about 100, 150 people downloaded every week. So it's quite a substantial demand for this, you know, for this type of data that other people can then build on. You can just go to HDX and just you know, Google social connectedness and just download that data set. Um, the second example is a more recent project um, that I've already mentioned with uh, Teresa, uh, Matt Jackson, and, and Raj Chetty um, on social capital, where again, you know, in, in, the micro data set on the social networks that we use to construct these measures of social capital aren't shareable in a meaningful way. But, you know, we have, the, we have this uh, data set that has, you know, multiple measures of social capital, again, for every zip code, every high school, every college in the U.S., is a you know, simple way to download CSV files. And then there's also this interface, socialcapital.org, where you can explore that data and so on. And, and, and I think, um, you know, I think just to close the loop to, to, you know, to the earlier presentations, I think that maximizes impact in all of the different directions that we had. It helps you maximize academic impact because, you know, you're going to get cited when other people use the data set. But importantly, in particular, if you invest in something like this visualization, and that you can see here, it lowers the barrier for other people to use the data. Um, in particular, here I'm thinking community groups, policymakers, et cetera. So we've worked a lot since, you know, since releasing this in the fall with mayors who are like looking at their own city and are starting to realize, wow, like this school, you know, or, or, you know, a super in, school superintendents who can like just, you know, who don't know how to read or open a large CSV file. But they can look at this, they can zoom into their own school district, and they can start looking which schools are doing better on social capital measures, which are doing worse. And so they can start trying to figure out what they can replicate from the, you know, the schools with you know, high levels of social capital at the schools with lower levels of social capital, right? So you're just, you know, to, you're just lowering the barriers of entry for people who, you know, who might often not be able to open an Excel file effectively, but who are the people on the ground in, you know, in, 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 in and community organizations, et cetera, who might be able to actually do relevant things with the data that you have. And so I, I think this is something not just for collaborations with firm data. I think for almost any type of research that we have, that we do, if you can work at making aggregated or something data sets accessible to others, I think that's just tremendous value. And, and, and I would hope that you know, many of you are interested in kind of doing more of that. Thanks a lot to all three of you. Uh, I will probably throw three questions, one question to each of them, but I hope that you have some questions as well uh, and be bold enough to go to the microphone and ask some questions. Uh, so let me just summarize uh, briefly the main messages I took away. Of course, it doesn't do, do justice. But when Rolf essentially was thinking very much, um, we should follow an agenda thinking approach. And this is actually a nice, check whether the idea is really worth it pursuing. I think that was one of the messages. And if you go for a new approach, you might find a lot of resistance as well. Don't be discouraged. So my question is, when should you give up then? Uh, if you get no positive feedback even after 10 years, or is there also a, a point where you would actually give up at the end of the day? Ulrike well, was very much contrasting two approaches. One is to maximize pups, and the other one is to advance sciences. And you also mentioned, you know, the whole thing is more a marathon rather than a sprint. Um, the question I have for, for Ulrike is essentially, how do you keep engaged in a marathon and how many parallel projects do you want to work on? And is it sometimes helpful to put the project aside and jump to another project in order to come back? Um, uh, what's about that? So what also what I haven't heard is that we have heard a lot from um, Johannes uh, to what extent private firms can stimulate your research and get data in, to what extent policy can uh, also be stimulating and getting new ideas and uh, the relevance of certain ideas. And then Johannes was emphasizing very much the entrepreneurial spirit that, you know, going after new data sets and collaborating with firms uh, and uh, very much, you know, this dichotomy, the data-driven versus question-driven. That's a very important way of thinking. And, you know, that you have to involve essentially lawyers sometimes. But that the big question for me is, and what he emphasized a lot, is that you have to have a trust relationship with people inside the firm. What I have often experienced is that the rotation inside firms is very high. So you build up a trust relationship, and within a year or two, they move on to another unit, 
and then move away. So how do you deal with that? Uh, do you have a whole team you have a relationship with? Uh, but there's a lot of rotations within companies. And I hope that uh, you might have some questions too um, to throw at them. And then perhaps you can make a, another quick round. So the, the mic is on, that was the signal. <laughs> um, perhaps we can just add some and then we go. Otherwise we just talk among ourselves. <laughs> Which do you really want to say first? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, it's a good thing that um, I still have here the slides of um, Johannes, because before I answer the questions you addressed to me, um, I did want to point out um, there was uh, there were there was this instance where he said, "Well, let me maybe contrast with your JIE, a Journal of International Economic Comments." Well, that doesn't quite work, you know. We we do want if if you do want to get tenure, you know, you you do want to aim. I forgot how you said, like for to produce something, and um, definitely. De definitely agree. But what I was trying to say here is that at some stage in your career, when you're going beyond the, okay, do I have enough beans to count to get, to, to get tenure? And you're starting to think about the broader impact and you're, you're starting to make sure that you're going to have an enjoyable life here. It does pay off <laughs> um, to kind of invest effort in, into a possibly other outlets. And so I had the JIE example because I once got, got, I know nothing about international economics, but kind of got, got invited to talk about how experience effects may, may also be relevant to international capital flows. And that was actually, was quite interesting to me. And I think it like opened up the conversation with the whole community, these international economists I like normally don't talk to. And they started learning about, you know, non-traditional ways to model human belief formation. And, and, and so I think that was really valuable to further the, the agenda, which I really care, deeply care about, that we all think more about the power of the past, of how past experience stay with us. And this year, I, I guess both of the last slides um, are really good examples. So, you know, um, you just said, okay, you can go to this data set here, and then you're citing the JEP paper, so Journal of Economic Perspective. So that's not, I mean, it's often one of your most cited papers if you have one in the JEP, but it's not a traditional, like, top five paper that, that gets you tenure. But... I completely agree that this will pay off in the long run. It will pay off, of course, for the rest of the profession to have access to this data and people will be very grateful, but it will pay off also Ralph's point towards kind of, you know, spreading the work and to kind of the broader profession to, to get in, engaged and as you are putting it, to have fun of other people kind of, kind of to talk to. And it's exactly um, this type of work, which I think we shouldn't lose uh, track of. This is what I was trying to say. On the two concrete questions, well, how do you keep being engaged and how many projects um, do, you, do you run parallel? On the, the first one, I'm a good person to ask, and the second, maybe, maybe not, I don't know, but I'll tell you. Um, so um, for me, I think this is where um, human interaction is um, the most important contributor. So to have like great students to work with, great colleagues to work with is enormously powerful. So even if I were able to do some project completely on my own, I have the full skill set, I'm organized enough to kind of pull it through, I would always get get courses. Um, like you've kind of, it's, it's, it's just so much more fun to interact. I do think um, COVID-19 um, taught me um, how important it can be to be in the room and soak up all sorts of other signals which are uh, maybe less visible e uh, even on Zoom. And in the same category, I would put things like here, the conferences. You know, we do know that the attendance at the ASSA is down from 12,000 to 6,000 um, because the job market isn't, isn't there anymore. And, you know, I was also personally very much in doubt, should I come this year or not? And then got invited to, to you know, to, to some sessions and, and other stuff. So I, so I came and I'm really realizing on how much kind of it's reviving me to talk to people, to have these random conversations. There's something really good about this uh, process. You can generate it also at your school. So already, as if you're in the PhD student camp, I highly recommend to have kind of a weekly mini lunch something seminar where you share research ideas. Um, uh, junior faculty these days is amazing in organizing junior faculty seminars. So I've generally kind of these brown bag kind of lunches. I think all of this interaction really like keeps you engaged. And then um, if you are, according to my approach to working on top topics you really care about and then reach out to policymakers or kind of some, you work with firms, then it's often baked in automatically and you see how much they appreciate kind of what, what, what you're finding. I think this is a really, really good way to keep going. I do think 
again, I think most of you I might be too young for that, but it, it, at some point it becomes hard to keep reinventing yourself. You know, you come out of the PhD with a set of uh, tools and looking at the world differently, and then you get somewhat ingrained in your in your view. And I think the most successful people who keep doing new stuff, like for example, uh, my colleague David Card, um, I really admire most of everything is how he keeps reinventing, keeps, keeps uh, like opening up to new tools, engaging in new approaches and, and so on. And this can be enormously rewarding, even though, you know, it's a beta delta problem in the short run, you know, it's easier to keep going with the setup uh, you have already. Um, how many projects? Not too many. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely in the too many camp um, um, very often because I do get so excited about many different things. So I used to think, well, there's some colleagues, um, for example, my colleague uh, Enrico Moretti is kind of famous for always like having the rank ordering of his projects and he knows what the number one, the highest expected payoff one is and presumably only working on that and putting all his effort in that. And I admire that and I will never be able to achieve that. In practice, I think um, rank ordering is not a bad thing. You know, to have some clarity about what's the thing you really want to advance, you really want to push forward. And then, um, of course, you will get stuck. It's in the co-authors camp. The firm is not giving you the data they, they promised they would give you, or they have to re lawyers are getting involved, like worst scenario, and then they have to review stuff and so on. And so, so to kind of say, okay, then I go to number two, then I go to number three, I think is good. But to have kind of a primary project where you're planning on touching on every week, because that's the highest expected payoff for you at your stage in your career, I think can be, can be quite helpful. And then you can have a secondary and tertiary and kind of go down the line. That, that would be my advice. I think I covered your questions here. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to be very brief on like uh, where to stop. Like, I don't think I have a good answer to that, to be honest. I think like it doesn't work for 10 years. That sounds a little long. Um, um, I think at the end of the day, like, and maybe I'm a bit more in the in the in the question driven camp. Like, we need to answer certain questions, and so so I think if you're interested in like big shifts in demand, let's say, there's lots of questions that we're thinking about. We'll just have to sort of figure out how to answer those questions, and and so so we start somewhere. There may be the wrong approach, and so if someone comes up with an approach that I think is like truly better, then I'm the first one to jump ship and and to sort of move to that approach. But ultimately, I want to answer those questions. Those I think are important. And I want to make, I want to make progress on that. Um, uh, I want to sort of pick up on one point that that you mentioned in terms of like how many projects do at the same time. I think there's a related question uh, or related issue is that um, make sure to finish your projects. Um, and so uh, this is it, it's always like really really exciting uh, to work on new stuff. Uh, and and um, that problem gets worse as you I, know, I think as you get older. Uh, there's always like something new to work on and revisions get more painful over time, I think, to work on those. Um, just really try to finish stuff, like leave no one behind and make sure stuff gets published. Uh, in the long run, that's going to really pay off, I think. So uh, like, like make sure that you finish stuff. Yeah. Um, so Mark has asked me on what happens when the people you work with rotate out and I think particularly in the US that is quite common and you know if you work with people in Europe they're often at the same firm for decades it's less of a risk in the US people move around a lot more and so honestly there's no good solution it, it, it's a it's a risk that you face um, my experience has been that when this has happened and you have someone that you have that trust relationship with they will try and find someone else inside the firm to kind of become the new sponsor so if you have someone who's really invested in the project too, they don't want to see it die when they move to a different department or even when they move to a different firm. And just the same way that when you leave a department, you try and hand over all your actual work-related projects to someone else so there's some continuity. I've been lucky that when people I've worked with, you know, say at, at Vanguard have left the firm, they've sort of invested some of their own political capital in helping us find follow-on sponsors for our work. Um, but that's not a guarantee. And one of the risks of working with firms is that the person leaves. And like, you just need to be aware that that's one of the risks you're dealing with, one of many risks of, of you know, dealing, dealing with firms. I also want to just add to the how many projects to, to do, because I think, I think that's one of the most challenging questions. And so I just want to add to that that there is sort of a life cycle, I think, to that as well. I, I, you know, to be honest, I, you know, I have three young kids now. I have many fewer hours in the week that I can dedicate to work than you know, when I was a fresh assistant professor and you know, I 
no kids. And so, you know, there was much more time to spend. And so there was a painful period when I didn't make that adjustment fully yet. And I tried to keep working on the same number of projects with a substantially reduced numbers. Of, and you can imagine how that goes and it's frustrating and it's frustrating for you. It's frustrating for the co-authors and, you know, it took me some adjustment to get there. Um, so I think that you, you just need to be aware of that. Like there's going to be things that will come up in your life, you know, and they will either temporarily or, you know, for a substantial period of time, reduce what you can do. And you need to adjust how many projects you have. Now the right way to do it, I think, I think I've become better at that is to be judicious about what projects to start, right? Like think upfront, you know, say no to things. Like you don't have, not every person who says, can we work on something together? You have to say yes to. You can just be honest and say like, in particular, if you're the type of person like me who's pretty OCD and actually needs a certain amount of involvement in every project I put my name on, right? It's one thing, some people's very happy to just be involved in lots of things and, you know, and maybe they'll write the introduction at some point. Like I, you know, it took me a very, very long period of time to not write every line of code in empirical papers myself. It, it was, again, a, a difficult learning process to trust other people enough to kind of hand some of these things over, and that helps with having, you know, the naturally reduced few hours for research, because it's not just kids. I mean, kids for me was the biggest thing, but then you sit on service and intern to school and this committee, that committee, president of the, you know, like so many things, um, just reduce the, the time you have for research. And that means you can start taking on different roles in research projects. You don't necessarily have to be the person that writes every line of code anymore. It's difficult, right? Like we're all little, you know, OCD. And I think you'll lose something too, because I think in empirical work, a lot of it is actually being in the data. So I still insist on being in the data, but I don't insist on, you know, actually producing all of it. So that, that helps a little bit over time as your time gets less. And then you are going to be doing fewer projects. The benefit is that over time you get better at making this rank order. The, your ability to judge earlier on about which projects have high upside and which do not just improves. There's just a learning process there. And so, you know, as you do fewer projects, you know, the number of projects you do declines faster than the number of good projects you do, I think, because you, you know, you're better able at screening out early on the stuff that might seem exciting, but you kind of six months in, you're like, now I'm kind of stuck with something I'm not that excited about. So, I, you know, but, but I think we should be honest about the fact that life just, you know, it often involves in ways where, you know, there isn't a fixed number of hours available that you always have. And, you know, how you think about research, how much you can take on just has to vary with that. And that's just, you know, a normal feature. And I think we should talk about that more because it's like easy enough to say, oh, you know, just do all the projects. It's not possible. There's like lots of other things. And, you know, they're probably more important as well. Lots of important insights, uh, how to do and conduct research, uh, how to manage it. You still have a chance to go to the mic, anybody who wants to be the first one and is bold enough, otherwise, oh, perfect. Hi, thank you for this uh, great discussion. My question is around the use of private firms data. Uh, how would you address a potential concern, especially if you're sourcing data from a sm small firm, that it is representative of the entire industry or the economy. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is with you know with small firms, um, how do you deal with the fact that it's not representative? I mean, the honest answer is you say it's not representative. Um, ideally, you find questions where um, the type of question you ask is sort of tailored to the audience. I have. And for me, the best example here is. You know, my colleague Teresa's job market paper used data from a small fintech firm um, where people signed up to get help to reduce their debt, their credit card debt. A very selected sample of people who sign up. And her question was, why do people fail to pay down their debt after they want to pay it down? So the fact that everybody signed up here made this a very selected sample. It's one amongst everybody with credit card debt. It's the set of people who want to pay it down. And now you can start thinking it kind of turn that almost into a strength. Like, why do people fail to follow through on their plans, right? So in an ideal world, the type of selection you have, um, you know, is, um, is, is, you know, can be helpful. I think fundamentally, I, you know, I've become more flippant in my responses um, to questions about this. I've been, you know, 
been doing this for a long time, and I get this in every, every seminar someone will say. And you know, say you work with Facebook, it's oh, but it's not not everyone's on Facebook. Yeah, and I like, yes, sure. I'm 100% representative of 75% of the US population. Like, the, I'm happy with that. Or, you know, when I'm working with Vanguard, people say, yeah, but you know, the types of people who sign up to Vanguard are so different to the overall investor population. How can I learn anything new? So I'm like, well, it's a starting point. So far, we had data on no individual investors. Now we have data on, you know, people holding $5 trillion of assets. That's a starting point, right? So I think this idea that every data set has to be like this great representative of you, it, it's just not a realistic expectation for any of this type of thing. I think you, like, anyway, it's, it's easier now to be flippant about it than, than it, earlier on, or worried more about it. But I think you're starting, you know, people throw out that question all the time without actually having kind of like, what's the next, like, why are you asking me that? Do you have a specific concern? Like, is this representative? No, it's not. But you have a specific concern about some type of behavior I'm seeing that doesn't translate elsewhere. And so I think, like, you know, and, and maybe, again, sometimes you can turn it into a strength. Hi, uh, my name is Yahya from Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. I have a question for all the panelists. Uh, if you have only one advice to give to a young researcher who just got uh, a position as an assistant professor, what would be that advice? Thank you. <laughs> I, if, I, if I can only give you one advice, it's um, protect your research writing time. Put it in your calendar, block out. It doesn't need to be, don't be over ambitious, like at least six hours a day, I need to think hard. No, let it be one hour, two hours, let it even be half an hour and just protect that time and no, no matter what, kind of uh, stick to it. Um, as from personal experience and definitely from what I see around, everybody will pull at you to do all sorts of other stuff and um, you are responsible for protecting that time. That's my one advice. <laughs> Next. Yeah, <laughs> beyond what we talked about. Um, no, I think, um, um, I guess I think it's, I don't know, at least from my own experience, I think it was very useful for me to like still like go to like lots of different like seminars, at least when I when I joined Chicago, just to sort of like learn what other fields are up to that I hadn't seen as much. And so it was very useful for me to be, to be exposed to like different like fields, different areas, and to just develop ideas uh, beyond that. And that really helped sort of some of my research. I would sort of say like just be very open-minded still very early on and don't get stuck in sort of like an, uh, an area too too quickly. I mean, for me, it's simple. It's submit your job market research. That's it. <laughs> Okay, so I hope that all these new insights uh, will help you to write a lot of great papers. So in a few years, they will all show up in the AFA program. Um, and I hope to see you later for the business meeting, which is, I think is at 5.30 here in the same room. Thanks again for coming. And thanks, Batika, give a big round of applause to our three panelists. <laughs>